Dear Heavenly Father, we want to exalt you tonight. We are so thankful to be here, even though it's raining, that we are able to meet without difficulty of travel. We thank you so much for the gift of the internet, for the gift of technology to do this, Father God. Father, as we study your word tonight, we first want to exalt you. We pray that your name and the name of your son would be high and lifted up in our study, that we would we would not exalt ourselves, but we would lift you up. Father God, as we do this, we do look at our own uh, sinful nature. We all commit sin. And we ask forgiveness, and we come boldly before your throne because of the one who is interceding at your right hand, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And Father God, we do want to lift up the special prayer request tonight for Pastor Edwin, Father. May your hand of grace be upon him. May your spirit fill him. We ask for a, a full 100% recovery, that he would wake up tomorrow a new person, that he'd be able to go home from the hospital. And Father God, we do pray that he would get the rest and, and the de-stress that he needs, Father. We know that we're all supposed to take rest. It's commanded uh, in your word for us to rest. And so I pray that he would be able to get some rest and that other uh, able men can, can fill his shoes for a period of time. Um, at TBC, Father, we pray for the, the success and the peace of TBC. We pray for the success of, of the, the church. And Father God, everyone has needs. We all have needs. You know those needs. We, we all have them. I pray that you would provide for every single person's needs. We also think of Sherwin and, and the needs that he has with his business. Father God, I pray your blessing would be on his business, that there'd be recovery. We ask for life to be spared through this terrible crisis of COVID. And that we would do preventative measures um, would be put in place and that we could, we could get back to, to doing the work of the ministry and also to taking care of our families. Father God, be with each and every one of us tonight. We ask that your spirit would be here, would be here in Top Loban, would also be here in, in, um, outside of Manila with Rodrigo. Um, we just pray for a blessing now upon this time, uh, Rodrigo and Kavita. It's in your son's uh, precious name. Our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay. So um, thanks again for attending. This is session two for our study in Colossians, and we're finishing our study in Colossians 1, 1 to 13. So just by way of introduction, I'm going to review the PowerPoint from last week. Just by way of introduction, uh, the objectives, here are the objectives that I hope that by the end of this study that, that each one of us will have. Uh, number one, that we, we will become familiar with the text of the epistle to the Colossians. So one of my goals for this, this study is for us to become more familiar with the word itself. In, in, in all forms of study, oftentimes people can go into all these different uh, research, but they don't actually know the text. And so I do want us to become very familiar, be familiar with what chapter one says, what chapter two says, what chapter three says, and chapter four to be familiar with the content. That, that is one of my goals and, and, my, and my prayer for the study. Um, number two, to also to become familiar with its theology. That is the theological content, themes and structures in the epistle. And I missed that one typo, so I apologize for that. Um, but I do want us to understand the theological content and the themes and its structure. There is, there is some deep theological truth that is very significant so I do want us to become familiar with the theological content and the themes. There are some themes. They are profound. And then next, next, I want us to be introduced to methods and examples for teaching and preaching the epistles. So we do want to move from uh, content, what the text says, to theology. So we're moving from what the text says, the, the, the content, to theological truth, and then to application. So, so the end goal is, is application. So it's just not for our knowledge. It is also for our being able to preach and teach this epistle. Methods of instruction. So, of course, we're going to be doing a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. I'll, I will always review this each week just so that we're familiar. We will also have a lot of it is student discussion and interaction. So I do want to encourage everyone, the, the most benefit you will receive from this course is doing, making observations and questions prior to coming to class. And, and, and the questions and the, and the observations should be primarily the actual content of what we're studying. If you, if you can be familiar with what the text is saying, that will cause you to have questions, that will also cause you to make observations, 
And that will really put you in a great place to then interact in the, in the discussion. And then that'll be a springboard to asking those deeper questions. So I do want to encourage us to do the homework. I understand that we're, we're all doing full-time work. And so if you can't, don't feel pressure. But uh, if you have the time, it would be beneficial. So one thing you could do is for your devotions, you could be using this as your, as your devotional time. That's one, one, one area that you could be using. For. So again, not telling, but just recommending. And then of course, um, homework is centered upon the, the, the student's development of his observation, Bible study, and critical thinking skills. So it's one thing to make an observation or to ask a question. That's a specific skill set. That's like an investigator, uh, detective. And then that's one area that you, as a pastor, as an expositor, we need to develop. But then also uh, those Bible study, uh, um, the Bible study and then critical thinking. So these two are really taking this raw content and then making uh, profound truths, making profound truths or identifying truths and then also applying. So that's where the critical thinking comes in. I do want us to be developing our critical thinking skills and also our Bible study skills. So those, those take time, those take practice. They don't come overnight. Very few people are gifted in the area. People will say, oh, Tim, you're gifted in this. I've had some people say that, and, and I'll push back. I'll say, I'm not really gifted. It's taken a lot of years of practice, and I'm not saying that to be prideful. I'm just saying that sometimes people think, I'm not gifted, so I'm not going to really do this. And a lot of it is, a lot of it is, is just doing the work. And so that, there's no pride in that. It's just we need to be diligent in, in studying the Word of God. And uh, no doubt there's a lot of passages that speak to that. Um, so let's just go over a quick overview now for session. This will be actually session one, session two, because we were continuing the same. Um, so we'll read the text. I'm going to read the text again. We're going to do, just briefly go through the introduction to the background of, the, uh, of Colossae. Again, we talked about this last week, just really because some of us weren't here. And then we're going to go into a verse-by-verse -verse commentary and then move to conclusion and application. So that's the goal for tonight. And then I'll just briefly mention the uh, assignment. So um, let's go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and read the, the I'm going to go ahead and read Colossians 1, 1 to 13. I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this we have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from this day, from the time we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the purpose of all endurance, patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So as always, wow, just so, just so much truth, uh, so much benefit for each one of us. Let's go ahead and I just want to, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Before we study the text, let's go back to our PowerPoint. And I'm just going to review uh, some of the things that we have already discussed. I just want to re review this briefly and then we'll get into the text. So 
The setting of Colossians, here's a map. If, uh, if you can look closely, um, the, the, the letter is written to Colossae. We, we um, discussed about how it's in present-day modern Turkey. And so it's actually uh, one of the churches in modern-day Turkey. And um, just some quick, a quick few facts about the epistle. It's a prison epistle, which means that it was written during Paul's prison time in Rome. This is towards the end of his life, getting close to when he's, uh, church tradition has him being executed in Rome. And so it's, there's debate. We can't be dogmatic on the date, but it's probably around 62 AD. 62 AD, plus or minus. Um, I think church tradition has Paul being uh, martyred around 68 AD, plus or minus 68 AD. And then um, we talked about this before. The, ch the, the church at Colossae was lightly established during Paul's third missionary journey as he ministered for three years in Ephesus. And so the tradition goes that Epaphras traveled to Ephesus and responded to Paul's gospel message and then took that message back to Colossae, and he's considered the founder of the church in Colossae. And so actually we see at the end of Colossians, in Colossians chapter, I'll just read it, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. And so that, that description not only describes the purpose of, for the writing of a letter, but it also describes Epaphras. And I think one of the questions from last week from Bullboy was, who, who brought the letter was Epaphras? It seems to be that Epaphras is with Paul in Rome, and so he's sending the greetings. So it probably went through a, a courier or, or just generically to, to Colossae. But you have this, this man who started the church and really continued to be involved in the church after leaving. Really a powerful testimony. We'll also discuss Epaphras more because he's mentioned it in our passage. But really just describing the faithfulness of, of what Epaphras did for this church. And um, just, just a, a, a great man of God. Um, just a couple more quick, again, just by way of introduction. I had this, I had this picture here. This is just to give us a brief topography. This is an unexcavated mound. So there's probably a settlement in the area of Colossae or, or a, a, a village that has not yet been excavated. But I just did this to give you a top, topography of what it looks like. So this is, this would be, this would be what the, the land of Turkey looks like and probably looked like um, when, when Paul wrote the letter. Uh, here's another excavation, partially excavated. So again, you can see the topography is, is a lot different than the Philippines. Um, probably closer to some places in the U.S. You have, you have a lot of rocks. You have, you have like fields, rolling hills. You don't really have rolling hills in the Philippines. You have either big mountains, plains or you know rice paddies and then just the uh, uh the jungle diva so it's a totally different top topography than than uh the philippines and then um so let's just go in now to the outline so i have a brief outline for what we're going to be studying tonight so again this is just an overview so you can kind of see where we're going and there's really just three major areas that we're discussing the first is the introduction in Colossians 1, 1 and 2, you have the introduction of the author, the audience, and then a salutation or a greeting. Okay, so that's verses 1 and 2. And then in verses 3 to, 3 to 8, you have a thanksgiving to God for the brothers in Colossae. So Paul is thanking God, and he's going to describe the work of God uh, in the lives of the, of the brothers in Colossae. And so that's, that's uh, Colossians 1, 3 to 8. And then in verses 9 to 14 is this prayer for spiritual growth or maturity. So I just, I read you, uh, I read you the conclusion where Epaphras is praying that, Epaphras is literally praying that you will, in his prayers, he's praying that you would stand mature uh, and fully assured in the will of God. Okay, so that's Epaphras' prayer. 
And Paul's prayer at the beginning of Colossians is the same. So in a way, it's almost like bookends. So if, you know, there's people always say, well, what's the primary purpose of the letter? And um, I would say the primary purpose of the letter, because of this, these bookends, Paul's prayer in 9 to 14, and then the mention of, of, of Paphras praying for them, it's probably primarily that, that these uh, Colossian believers would be mature uh, in Christ um, and that they would stand in full assurance of the will of God. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of Colossians in the nuts. Now, of course, we could say that's the purpose for all of the letters. Fair enough. But that gives us, that gives us if we know the purpose, then that really helps orient us why Paul includes the content. The content of Colossians is specifically aimed at issues in the church. So we can ask questions like, well, why didn't Paul include this? Why is Colossians different than Romans? Why is it different than Galatians? Well, Paul is writing with theology, but with a specific context in mind, the, the context of Colossae. So that's very beneficial as to why he puts certain things in, leaves other things out. And it's helpful for us in our situation. Until we understand the contextual situation of their day, it's very difficult for us to contextualize it for us, okay? Contextualization is the application of the gospel, the application of spiritual truths in our specific context, okay? And so uh, contextualizing the gospel in Manila and in the Waray Waray region or in the Cebuano region of Region 8, it's going to be the same and different, okay? It's going to be the same and different. So maybe as we study through this book, we, we can discuss that. Um, how things are different than even in the first century, how things are different, how things are the same. Contextualizing in, in the United States is very different than in the Philippines. Um, the truths are the same. The application is sometimes different. So is everyone tracking with me on contextualization, et cetera, et cetera? Make, make sense? It's good? Okay, cool. All right, so what do we have next? Um, all right, so then we have a couple of questions I want us to be looking at before we get in the text. So just lastly, I have some good questions for us to be thinking about. Number one, in this, in this passage, what is the gospel accomplishing? What is the gospel accomplishing? So I don't want you to immediately answer. I don't want you to immediately like, oh, I know that. Uh, perhaps you do, and perhaps you're correct. But let's be thinking about, as we study this passage, um, what is the gospel accomplishing? Um, number two, what is the content of Paul's prayer for the spiritual maturity of the brothers in Colossae? So I've just stated the bookends, the, the prayer for spiritual maturity. And so now the question we want to say is, what is it? What does it look like? What is its description? If, if this is the primary content of Colossians, what does this spiritual maturity look like? That's very important. We can talk about we can talk about spiritual maturity, but until we really get specific, it's just abstract. It's Christianese. It's, it's, it's uh, not clear. Um, number three, what is the relationship and importance of knowledge and good works? <laughs> so this is the, the perennial problem. People say, you are just always focused on knowledge and theology. I want to see your good works. Other people are saying, uh, all you do is good works. You're not deep. And so I want to ask the question, what is the relationship, if there is a relationship, between knowledge and good works? What is the importance of the two? I want us to be thinking about it. What's more important? What's more fundamental? Uh, I want us to be thinking about that as we, as we work through this text. I, I think we'll be surprised, and, um, and uh, I hope that we'll see. These are foundational questions that I want to answer. So at the end of this study, we'll come back and we'll discuss to make sure that we, 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 we've answered them, okay? Uh, any questions or comments, or can we get into the text? We're good to go? Okay, let's go. Let's, let's dive into the Word of God. This is my favorite part of our study. I, I love this. This is just, this is great. Okay, so what I'm going to do really quick is we have some questions. We have some questions here. And um, let's hold these questions where they're still present. Some of these were asked by Bowboy. He's not here. Let's, let's keep them on the table. Let's, let's see if we can answer some of these questions. Maybe some of the questions we can't answer. Maybe Colossians 
we're limited. We're limited by what the, the, the text says. And so let's just put these on the table aside and we can come back to them later. Um, I just want to quickly go through here just by way of review, and then we're going to move to the new content here. Um, uh, we talked about here, uh, we identified Paul, if you can look to my left, which would be your right, I believe. It's your right on the screen. Uh, we, we, we identified Paul. He's the, he's the author, and actually Timothy as well. So the two that are writing the, the, the letter are Paul and Timothy. And we did talk about how Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus. And Christ signifies, a, that's a very technical title that we can't overlook. It literally is it's from the, the Hebrew word Messiah, which is translated or transliterated into English Messiah, but it's the anointed one, the chosen king of Psalm 2, of, of, of 2 Samuel. We could also mention here um, uh, 2 Samuel 7. This would be the Davidic, Davidic covenant. And so the importance here is that Jesus is the king and he's sending Paul. So Paul has authority. We talked about this. We talked, we, we emphasize this. Paul has authority that Timothy does not have. Okay. Timothy is just identified as the brother. And actually, actually, if we look here, we, we, I, we highlighted um, this connection here, this, this relationship here. Diba? Uh, Timothy is actually equated with the church in Colossae. They're both identified as brothers. That's not to minimize them, but it is, it is to accent the authority of Paul on behalf of Christ, an authority that none of us will ever have, okay? Um, and uh, that is really then accentuated here with, with he is this apostle, this special sent one by the will of God. And I, I do... There was debate in our other class. Henry knows about it. But I do think this would be a passage here where apostle is a technical name. And, and this comes into debate. Uh, this is debated in Ephesians chapter 4. Diba Henry with, with this idea of apostle, prophets, uh, pastors, um, teachers, gospel proclaimers. It says evangelist, but I don't like, I don't like evangelist because it's a little bit vague. I want to say gospel proclaimers. Okay. I want to be clear here. All right. But what I'm trying to get at is that this apostle is a special, a special category that is no longer in effect today it died it ended when, when when the apostles the special 13 had passed away i want to emphasize that and this is debated no doubt people there are there there are there are self-proclaimed apostles today and um you know uh and there's different ways of interpreting the word apostle we discussed that i don't want to go into all those details but but there is but there is this is a unique office that has gone has been done away with the close of the canon and the passing away the apostles actually if you wanted to look at the discussion that we had it's on our youtube channel and i can actually post that we, we discuss ephesians chapter four under the i team the I team uh, Christian, uh, the I team operations manual. We have an actual video there. So, if you want that video, maybe I'll post it again so that you guys can watch that discussion. And I'll put a time mark of where that discussion begins and ends, so you don't have to watch the whole thing. Remind me, remind me at the end to make a note to, to do that for us. Um, so that's all I want to say there. Um, and then here, I do want to highlight. To the saints and faithful brothers, I do want to highlight, there's different ways of translating this. I was working on translating this again in Greek today. I do want to use the word, I'm sorry, uh, to the holy and faithful brothers. I, I want to accent that. Uh, I, the holy and faithful brothers. So this would be, I do not want to say saints. I want to say holy. Um, 
or you could say to the set apart and faithful brothers. But that's the structure in the original language. And, and, I, and, I, and I think we need to maintain that. It's, it's very clear in, in Greek. Um, and uh, it signifies who we are. We're set apart. We're, we're all, they were also faithful. That was their description. And we're going to see how Paul really lifts that up. But they were set apart, um, and they were also faithful. And, and I do think that this holy is primarily speaking to moral excellence. So, Diba, we are set apart at the moment that we are brought into union with Christ. Okay, that is a fact. But we're also being sanctified. So we are sanctified. We are being sanctified. This is more speaking to our present sanctification, that we are exercising holiness. We, we are set apart uh, from, from the world. So we could also say set apart from the world. And then we have this grace and peace from God our Father. And I do want to emphasize here that this is highlighting our sonship. Our sonship. Uh, we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. And that is often accented in the New Testament. And we, whenever we see this, idea, this title, Father, God our Father, we need to highlight that. Because a lot of times in our churches, the people are not operating as if God is our Heavenly Father. They're operating as if they're a, ser they're, uh, they're a slave to this overlord. Okay, And that's not to diminish the fact that he is also our Lord. Okay, I'm not diminishing that, but, but people operate in this, in this fear, in this type of oppression with these burdens because they don't have a right view of who God is. He is, we are sons. There, there's no fear in that. There is not fear. Um, perfect love casts out fear. Okay, and then this, these two ideas, grace and peace, Grace is unmerited favor, so it's not just that we're, we're neutral, that now we have to earn our righteousness. It's that, it's that we, we, have, we, are, we have, we are, we will receive God's unmerited favor. And then peace. One of the greatest passages in all of Scripture is uh, Romans 5.1. Having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so up until faith, we were objects of God's wrath. We are children of wrath. We are under the condemnation of God as judge. And, and at the moment of faith, at the moment of faith, we are at peace with God. Peace is such a huge theme. To have peace with our Heavenly Father. It's so, it's so profound. Any comments or questions? Okay, Henry, go ahead. Okay, in grace to you and peace from God our Father. In here on earth, God did not promise na God did not promise that we can have we can have a comfortable life. Yeah. But his promise is he will give us peace even in times of difficulties. Yeah. Or, um, no, peace. great great excellent clarification. Excellent clarification, Kapitid. So, yeah, so the peace specifically is peace with God, okay? So the specific relationship that is being referred to here, it's not, it's not general peace across the board, meaning to say, because the God, Jesus says that he's come to bring division, the sword. He will, split, he will put family against family member. But you're right. The peace is primarily with the Father. There is peace with the Heavenly Father. That, that is the focus. There is a verse that says, I forgot, but it, your love is better than life. Your love is better than life. No, what is it? In, so even in this situation, present situation, because of COVID, business is closing, eventually closing. Sometimes uh, even our brother Edwin, he is in, his, in the hospital, sick. So these are difficulties, the real difficulties in time which we are experiencing. But God promised peace, peace in difficulties because he will be with us yeah. and he will never leave us. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, it's, 
it's everything is connected with him. It, it, it's it's the it's the peace that passes all understanding, Iba. And actually, that passage is from uh, is from Philippians. But it's the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. It's this it's this uh, a settled confidence in the midst of tribulation that is given to us. So it doesn't mean that the tribulation is removed. It doesn't mean that you're not experiencing tribulation. But you're absolutely right that the peace with God means everything. It's more than life because the, our primary issue is our separation from God because of our sin. Our primary issue is not money. Our primary issue is not social issues. Our primary issue is not Satan. The primary issue, according to the gospel, according to the gospel proclaimed by Jesus and also proclaimed by, by Paul, is this relationship with with our Heavenly Father. And if we have peace there, everything else is so small. Everything else is so small. Although it's hard for us to see that. Anyone else want to add? Excellent. Excellent point. Kaya, kaya it is by yeah. faith. By faith. I know. Okay. Uh, Ray, go ahead. Hey, Ray, Tim. Uh, just a uh, sudden flash of thought. But the, the thing with... Uh, this particular sentence, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father. It, it, it gives me an uh, important notice on the arrangement of words yeah. where it says grace. Because in, like, just like you have said, grace is an unmerited favor. And something that you can have or earn, right? but it's given to you. So in that manner, Paul could have put it peace and grace, but in this way, grace really precedes before you can have peace in something like that. No, and that, that, so that's that, what I have in mind. No, that that could be that that's could, my observation. Yeah, that could definitely be competent. But I, what you'd want to probably do is you'd want to. I haven't done this study, but look at all of the introductions. Look at all the salutations by Paul to see the pattern. If there's a pattern, absolutely it could be that, that for, for Paul, the most important thing is this grace. Yeah. There's a very important word in peace. Yeah. yeah. By experience, definitely by experience, it's really the grace of God that gives me that peace of really having the assurance, something like that. Yeah, it, it, it could be. Um, yeah. That, that could be, I, I don't, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't, I'd have to think about that, but it's a great observation. You, you, we would want to think about that, yeah, for sure. And, and there is, there is significant, how important. Anyone else want to yeah. add? We can move on. Anyone else? Yeah, want to add? Thank, one more, last, last. Because, yeah, Paul can said, Paul can write, grace to you and mercy from God, our Father. So, here is specific peace, peace from God our Father. So, tama no? grace to you. It, uh, it is written first, then a specific blessing is the peace. Yeah. It's the peace. I think uh, the, 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 the Christians in Colossians, they are also in difficulties. I don't know, we don't know what is the difficulties. They are having now. So peace is needed with them. It's not mercy. It's peace. So, no. So you want to study this for sure. I do know in the pastoral epistles, Paul says, so he's writing to Timothy, grace, peace, and mercy, I think. <laughs> I think he has the third one there. Because, and, and I heard one sermon say, Paul does this because Timothy needed, he was a pastor and he needed so much more. So I don't know, it could be. But I think your depth, I think both Ray and, 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 and Kuya and Henry are on to something that uh, perhaps even the, the wording and the structure and choosing peace and grace. Yeah, I, I think that's, those are great observations. And um, yeah, absolutely. We, we want to, I, I think what we want to see is when we're, what, what I want to focus on is when we're preaching this, we skip the introduction and we just want to go to, let's go to Colossians 1.13 with, 
the supremacy of Christ, and we and we and we gloss over these profound truths. And I and and I and I and I want to say for we, we should not gloss over this. And I think you're you, you all are tracking with me on that importance. And and for preaching and teaching, we would want to explore these things. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's go ahead and let's let's move on. And so. So we have verse uh, verse one is the author, verse two is the audience, uh, verse two b is the is the greeting, and then we have this we have this prayer. And actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to change this here because my outline is different. So this is a prayer, but this is also a this is also a thanksgiving here. So because there is a prayer, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna change this to thanksgiving. Of course, this this would be, in actuality, a prayer, Niba. This is a, this is a prayer, because he's he's speaking to God. So it's by definition of praying, he's speaking to God. So it's a prayer. But I, I want to be more specific because our outline. I want to match our outline because we're saying it's a Thanksgiving. And so the Thanksgiving is we always thank God. So so the object of the Thanksgiving uh, is God. Okay, and and then again he repeats the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when we pray for you, so there's the prayer component. Um, and then the reason we discuss, the reason for the reason for this is that since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. So you have faith in Christ Jesus, and then you have love for all the saints. So those are two different things, and they're both present. This is this is the testimony. This is their testimony. Okay. And what we, the attention that we drew, uh, the, 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 the emphasis that I really wanted to, that I wanted to draw your attention to last week was that the, the thanksgiving for the faith and the love was not aimed at the brothers. It was not aimed at, I thank you, brothers at Colossae, for your faith and for your love. No, it's I thank God for what for what you are doing here. And and what I really want to emphasize here is that is that even though they have to have faith, the, the faith they are exercising faith. Love they are exercising love. But what I want to emphasize here is that the uh, the source and ability are from God. Hence, he's thanking God. He's not thanking them. If the source and the act was coming from the believers, from the brothers, he, he would rightfully be thanking them. But then, so what I want to emphasize here is this is implying, and we're going to see this later, this is implying the work of God's spirit. So elsewhere, elsewhere, he will say, I worked harder than everyone else. Corinthians 15. But it was not I. It was God. It was in, in Corinthians 15. It was God's grace that was working within me. That was empowering me. Um, and so uh, even though we are called to have faith and we exercise the faith, we talked about this before, the battery. The one behind the faith, the one behind the love is the Holy Spirit. So there is no credit. There is no credit. Corinthians 1 says, if anyone's going to boast, <laughs> boast in the Lord. Hannah, Diva, Hannah doesn't take credit. She was in, she was, she was in the temple, in the tabernacle with Samuel. She was, she was praying. She was crying. She was fasting. And she doesn't, she boasts in the Lord in her prayer, in our study and prayer. She does not boasts in herself, and she warns her enemy, the, her rival, to not boast in herself. Don't speak proud words. And Paul emphasizes that in 1 Corinthians, that our boasting is not in ourself. And so what I want to say tonight is our thanksgiving is not in ourself. <laughs> we don't thank God for ourselves for what we're doing. We thank, we thank God for what he's doing in us. And, and we see this crystal clear. It is just so powerful here. I we always thank God for what for your faith and for your love. Okay, so 
our, our, our members, those that are underneath us, need to see that the credit goes to the Father. It does not go to ourselves. If it goes to ourselves, that breeds pride. That, that breeds uh, arrogance. That's setting up for us for a big sin. It's setting it up. So then now we're on the new content here. And so what is the reason? What is the reason for this faith and this love? We have a reason here. Because of the hope, and then there's a description, uh, a hope which is laid up for you in heaven. The people are, uh, the Colossae believers are having faith and they're having love, love for all the saints. What's the reason for them doing this? Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So let's, uh, let's see if Paul identifies, let's see if Paul further identifies what is this hope? What is this hope? Okay. Now, when I look at this next, this next phrase here, literally, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. Um, uh, the word of the truth of the gospel. It's a little awkward, Richard. We'll just leave it like that. Let me see what my translation is. I have a translation here. Just hang on one second. I translated this as, which you heard in the word of truth. The gospel, okay? So, so uh, a little awkward in the ESV, you know, you're always going to have different, tra- does someone have a different translation? Is, is someone using a different King James or NIV? Uh, Ray, go ahead. This is more translated in a more uh, liberal way. Okay. In LLT, which comes from your confident hope of God, of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this, expectations ever since you first heard the truth of the good news okay so that's 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 very dynamic and and that gives a slight nuance does anyone else have another translation okay so um what i want to emphasize here though is this word of this okay of this referring to hope right yes exactly excellent this is defi- this is defining and describing describing so this is a description okay so so uh where where have you heard of this hope before and so the description is you heard of it you heard of it where and so now it's going to give the location the location is the word of truth and then it's renamed It's renamed, okay? So this is a renaming. The gospel, okay? So we could, in a real way, we could just put an, we could put an equal sign here. What is another way of saying the gospel? The word of truth, okay? And the emphasis here is upon, um, People don't like, you know, that, that's your interpretation, this or that. But what's being emphasized here is the fact this is true. I mean, this is truth itself. I am the way, the truth, <laughs> and the life. Um, and so this is not your interpretation. This is not, I mean, this is, we're dealing with reality, an, an absolute truth claim. So this is why you can't, you wouldn't, you have this postmodern, you know, well, that's your truth. You know, not, I mean, this is making a truth claim. We either accept it or we don't. Um, and, 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 the, and, and the content is this hope, this hope, okay? So I, I want us to see this here. I, I want to start moving in this direction here, okay? So we can, uh, the, the hope introduces, but let's just get down. <coughs> uh, we can say in, in this, okay? Because that's what it's saying. Of this you heard 
in the word of truth. Okay, so we're just going to get right down to the nitty gritty. The hope which is in heaven is, is found in the gospel. Okay, all right. So, so this, I want us to start seeing this, that the gospel is not just for conversion, but also our sanctification. Or we could say our, or our maturity. Um, and, and we're going to unpack this more, but the reason why I'm saying this is because look at this is, is about, when we talk about gospel and conversion, you bought past tense, you, 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 you share with them the good news of what Christ has done. You bought, and then someone makes a decision. They, 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 they confess, they repent of their, they repent of their way. They confess their sins. And then they put, they put their faith and trust in, in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That becomes past tense, okay? And so people will often think about the gospel in our lives as being, that's like the entry, entry point, and then we move on to other things in sanctification. And there is, there is a, a, a level of truth. There are other things that we need to, 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 to do. There are other commands. But what I want us to see here is that in the gospel is the hope. In the gospel is the hope. Is, is, is our hope a past or a present and a future uh, reality? What is it? Is the peace a past, a present, or a future reality? Is the grace a past, a present, future? Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. It's past, present, and future. <laughs> yes! Yes! So if this hope, if the hope is... Uh, Past, present, and future. And it's contained in the gospel. You, we can't just say, okay, gospel is great for conversion. Let's go on to something else. No. What is giving us hope, what is giving us our peace, is this proclamation from the gospel. <laughs> the word of truth. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's like... You know, a lot of people are struggling with depression. They're struggling with different things because they've left the gospel. They've gone on to other things. And it's like, that is our hope. In, in IT curriculum, Henry, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that which I received, which I delivered to you, which I proclaim to you, which you believed and stand and are holding fast. Uh, uh, by which you are being saved, right? It's, it's, it's this past tense commitment. It's this present tense standing. It's this present and future tense uh, salvation. It's all of these things. And so like we, we as leaders, we as church members, we leave that. We leave that and then, and then we don't have hope. <laughs> how can we have, how can we feel the peace of God? How can we feel the grace of God? How can we have that hope? If it's in the gospel and we've set, we've set it aside, it's for the new believer. Let's go do something else. And so I really want to emphasize here is that um, we're beginning to see that the gospel is much more than just a past act that we do. And, and this really brings new significance, Mana Kapitid, for this gifting of evangelists, of gospel proclaimer. Do we have a gospel proclaimer proclaiming the gospel to us as believers? We're going to really see this significance. Let's, let's hold, let's, let's, let's just, let's see this, this unfold before us, okay? And so here we have, uh, we have this description here, Diva, which has come to you. So again, uh, again, so this is the hope, this is the God. So now specifically it's referring to the gospel, okay? So it's the gospel, which is the word of truth. So both of those errors are correct, Bob, because these two are equal, comma. So um, the which has come to you is the word of truth or the gospel. So this is, of course, an, an action. And this is also 
uh, past tense. So again, I'm not minimizing the need for conversion. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, okay, we can never know what conversion is. We're just always, we're always believing. No, no, no. There's a time for conversion. It has come to us, okay? So there's a past tense. There's a past tense understanding here, okay? Now watch this. Watch this. As. So we have this. Uh, this is a comparison. Okay. And again, we have this other, uh, again, a comparison as, right? As. So it's come to you as indeed in the whole world. So we're going to look at this. Watch this. This is crazy. We have a location here. We have a location here. And then we have this, what is the gospel doing? <laughs> What's the gospel doing? It is bearing fruit and it's increasing. In the whole world. And when you're looking at, when you're looking at actor, it's the gospel. The gospel is doing the work. Of course we proclaim it, but we cannot convince the unbeliever. It's the gospel that's the one bearing the fruit. <laughs> it's the gospel that's the one increasing. We are only the proclaimers of it, but we are not the ones doing the work. It's the spirit and the word in the heart. And we see this in Romans. Paul says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how should I hear without, uh, without uh, a, a speaker? And how shall I hear unless one son? But again, it's this hearing, the hearing, the hearing. But the one that does the work is the spirit. So here we have the gospel. And what's implied here again is the work of the spirit. Now, the next thing I want us to see here, this is going to get crazy, okay? This is going to get crazy, okay? I just want you to stay with me. This is going to be good, okay? Um, what is so interesting is the, the gospel has come to them, and then uh, the, the comparison is, is in the whole world, Diva. It's bearing fruit and increasing, okay? Um, and again, as it does among them. So, so again, the gospel is again a uh, location and this is specifically brothers so i'm just being technical here brothers at Colossae. okay now my question is uh the question i have for us is is this referring only to conversion. So does everyone understand this question here? The bearing fruit and increasing, is it only referring to bearing fruit as in, so the bearing fruit, the increasing, the question is, is this just converts? That's the question. Okay, so let's not answer it yet. Let's not answer it yet. I suspect it's not because the fruit is being born among them. And they're brothers. <laughs> they're believers. So, so it seems to be more than just conversion. But I don't, I don't want to infer yet. Let's wait to see what the text says. Okay, let's wait to see what the text says. Because... In, go ahead. The, the, the whole world. Yeah. The whole world. As indeed in the whole world so bearing it's the gospel is for the whole world and yeah yeah it's it's not limited only to the brothers in policy for the gospel it's for the whole world yeah but so the question though is that what i want us to be asking Cop, Cop, henry and and is that is it only concerning uh people coming to the faith is is, is what is the imagery being as the gospel brings in new brothers, is that the fruit or is there other fruit? Is there other fruit? Okay, so that's the question I want us to look at, okay? And, and the phrase that I want us to look here is, this is where 
our observation skills are so important, okay? So what I want us to do right now is I just want us to hold, I want us to look at that phrase and let's just hold it. Let's see if Paul is going to bring this up again, okay? Um, so, coming, so coming here, we have now a, a since. This is a since. So this is giving us time. This is giving us time concerning as it does among us. Okay, so it's going to give us a time. Since the day you both heard and understood. Okay, so this is again an uh, action. Action one, action two. Okay, now <laughs> watch. This is why when you're, what, what, what uh, Ray and Henry were really emphasizing here. Okay, it doesn't say our hope. It doesn't say the gospel. It comes back to what? It's a different word now. The grace of God. So again, the grace of God is contained in this word of truth. The hope is contained in the word of truth, the gospel. So do you see what I'm saying? So coming back to our issue, do we need God's grace today? Do we need to understand God's grace today? Do we need it today? It's in the gospel. <laughs> Cigarado, Cigarado, if it's in the gospel and we need the grace of God, we cannot limit it to conversion. How weak is that? How, how bad is that? So if we need the grace of God, that's contained in the gospel. Of course, again, this is, this is referring to among incompetent. This is their conversion, okay? This is, this is past tense, okay? So I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. What I'm trying to, I'm trying to, again, expand. I'm trying to expand. Gospel's conversion, yes. Without the proclamation of the gospel, without repentance and faith, someone cannot be brought in. But <laughs> it's also for us today. It's the gospel, the grace of God. In the gospel, I learn about the grace of God. In the gospel, I learn about God's continued favor, unmerited for me. Let's move on here, okay? And then and here what we're going to have is, I, because our time is, is uh, drawing nigh, I don't want to go into all of this, but essentially here, um, this is just, again, a, this is a, a comparison or um This is just a comparison, and he's going to highlight, he's going to highlight Epaphras, okay? Who is Epaphras? Um, you, learn, you learn this from Epaphras. So he's, again, he's just expanding. What he's doing is he's describing, if we can summarize this, describing their testimony. They learned it from Epaphras, okay? So, so this is really... This is really why they say, this here is why they say uh, he is the church planner. Because of this action word here, okay? They didn't learn it from Paul. They learned it from Epaphras. Epaphras was the church planner, okay? And then, and then Epaphras made known to us what? Your love in the spirit. Okay, so object person, object thing. Okay. So so Epaphras is the one who shares, he shares with Paul of their testimony. Okay, so it's very clear that Epaphras was most likely the church planner. He's the one that started the church in class, and he's the one really overseeing that. All right, and so that's, that's the Thanksgiving. That's the Thanksgiving. So Paul, what Paul is doing is he is really uh, thanking God for their testimony, and he's describing their testimony to them. So if we're going to look at big picture, that's what it is. He's thanking God for the testimony of the brothers in Colossae, okay? That's the big picture, all right? So next what we have here is, and, and, and um, what's the time? Okay, we have about 15 minutes. 
let's go ahead and let's look at this last. So in our outline, we had a thanksgiving, and now we have this prayer, okay? So there is this prayer here, this prayer here. And so um, we have a, uh, a time reference. Yibah, this is a time reference. And then this is the action. We have not ceased to pray for you. Yiba. And the action is, I mean, the object is the brothers, correct? So this is, this is the fruit. This is, I mean, this is the bread and butter of our discussion. Okay, we are getting now, we are getting now to the fundamental prayer of Epaphras and Paul for the church in Colossae. The rest of the book is going to really unpack this. This is like the big idea. Okay, so watch this. Hang on. Hang on to your seats, okay? So what is the specific? He is specifically asking for what? The specific thing that this is the content of, of what's being asked, okay? That. What is the primary content? That you would be a super hard worker and be able to do it by yourself, pull your life up by your bootstraps, get to work. Is that what he does? No. The first thing he says is he prays, action, that you may be filled. <laughs> you may be filled with what? Knowledge, knowing, knowing. Think about that. He doesn't say get out on the street and just go do it. The, the, the first thing that he wants to pray is to be filled. Who, let's ask the question. Who's doing the filling? What's, who is the implied actor that you may be filled? So just to be clear here, the you is also the object, object person. So for sure, grammatically speaking, this is the grammar of Paul is not saying fill yourselves. He would say, you fill yourselves with the knowledge of God. doesn't say that. Uh, so th th there, there is an implied actor here that is not known. From our previous discussion, who do you think the actor is? Who is the one who's going to be doing the filling? Sino. Sino Paul. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, and God, right? So, so we could say, we could say um, uh, because the thanksgiving is to God, we could say, just to be very clear, we could say, God is the actor or the source, and the Holy Spirit is the agent. So you're right. The Holy Spirit is the one that fills them with the knowledge, okay? But what's so important for us to see is that knowledge matters. And it's not any knowledge. It's knowledge related to the will, okay? But knowledge matters. People that don't want to know, that don't want to go into deep theology, that, that they say, oh, it's just, let's just do, let's just do, let's just do. No, no, no. Step number one, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us with the knowledge of his will. And so we need to be praying with this. But the end of this study, but before we go tonight, we are going to pray this prayer. We will pray this prayer. Someone will pray this prayer. And if you're uncomfortable, I will pray the prayer. But we're, we need to be praying for our members to be filled with the knowledge of his will first, okay? Now watch this. What is this? What is, this is a sphere. This is the realm. So, so, so this really gets down to the nitty gritty, okay? It's not just some random willy-nilly, random knowledge or knowledge that isn't without a context. This is with uh, the sphere Or we could say realm. Or we say realm, the area. Okay, so what is this? Uh, uh, what is the context? We could say context, right? It's spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay, so it's a kind of wisdom. It's a kind of understanding, but it's not physical. So, for example, we could talk about wisdom and understanding, right? We could have, uh, so wisdom, let's just, let's just define this first. Wisdom is the application 
of knowledge. Okay? So we, whenever you see the word wisdom, you have to understand knowledge is presupposed. Okay? So, but knowledge by itself is, is worthless. We want knowledge applied. Okay? And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different kinds of knowledge. There's scientific knowledge, right? There's engineering knowledge. There's architecture knowledge. There's medical knowledge. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of knowledge. This kind of knowledge is spiritual, okay? It's, it's knowledge, it's understanding, but it's more than just knowledge and understanding. It's applied knowledge. So you can say literally uh, applied spiritual knowledge so this is where this is why the word of god is so big on studying the word psalm one blessed is the man who does not walk nor stand nor sit in the in the wicked the sinners the scornful but his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law he meditates day and night <laughs> um the king deuteronomy 17 was to write his own copy of the law and he was to meditate upon it day and night Joshua 1, 7 to 9, right? Um, meditate in order that you can observe to do everything that I commanded you, okay? And so uh, that is the same for us. Meditation, uh, uh, knowledge, but it's not any knowledge. It's a spiritual knowledge that's applied, and we're applying it in our life, okay? Now, um, what is the purpose why is this prayer? Why is Paul praying this? What is the purpose for Paul praying for us to be filled with knowledge in all this spiritual wisdom and understanding? What is the purpose? Here we go. The purpose is purpose to walk, to walk, or to do, to do. So what's more fundamental, doing or knowing? <laughs> what's more fundamental, knowing? If you do knowing this, first, huh? It's knowing first because yes. you, you can't do a thing if you don't do a, know a thing. Yes. So people who say, "I don't, don't worry about knowing, just do it." No, no, that is that is uh, uh, that is that is from Satan. The prayer is, be filled with knowledge of his will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. To do what? To do. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So this is, this is now manner. Or we, we, could, we could also refer to this as the object of walking. But um, I do prefer, I, do prefer uh, I think it's the manner. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The Lord. That is, that is, I mean, to walk worthy of the Lord, I mean, that is, that is deep. That is, that is so convicting. Do we walk worthy of the Lord? Oh, my goodness. I fall short. I, I need to turn to the gospel to ask for forgiveness. See, do you see what I'm saying? If the gospel is there, we look at walking worthy, like, how can I do this? The gospel is there to give us the strength, to, to give us uh, freedom from fear. And then here, fully pleasing to him. Fully pleasing to him. Now, this is, where, this is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've been waiting for. I am not even kidding. I've been so excited about this. Bearing fruit in every good week work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, where have we seen these, this phrase before? Where have we seen it? I'm, I want to ask you, where have we seen this, this phrase? It's, it's in verse 6. Look <laughs> at the gold star. Verse 6. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 6. L literally the exact same verbs the exact same the exact same it's bearing fruit is actually a, a, a just one verb it's literally bearing bearing fruit it's an action word in in, uh, in greek so it's only one word 
and increasing. It's the same. So the gospel, as it is indeed bearing fruit and increasing, as it is among you. So, so what I want to see here is that here, the bearing fruit and increasing is not conversion. It's spiritual maturity. Do you see that? I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. This is, this is spiritual maturity. Mm. The gospel is bringing us. <laughs> Think about that. It's not, now, again, I'm not minimizing. Of course, it's also bringing fruit and, and conversion. But it's, the gospel's work is in this bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God. So even though, even though knowledge is more fundamental and the outworking knowledge is good works, the prayer is that we will have fruit. We will be increasing in both knowledge and good works. So <laughs> what, is, what is more important? Yes. <laughs> what should we be doing? Knowledge and good work. Yes. Amen. Amen. And then here we go. This comes back, this comes back to, 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 to the fact that we cannot do this on our own. Look at this. Being strengthened. Being, being strengthened. Being strengthened. With what? With all power in accordance to his glorious might. So this is, this is dealing with uh, accordance, or we could say here another word is in agreement. And being strengthened, again, this is why grammar is so important. I want to stress this enough. I can't stress this enough. The best pastors, the best teachers are grammarians. Martin Luther said, what is theology? Grammar applies. <laughs> grammar applies. <laughs> if the word of God is, I mean, if, if, um, if the word of God is inspired and that's our foundation, then us understanding grammar is so essential. Okay. But this is, this is a passive. This is passive. This is a passive verb here. Okay. Being strengthened. Okay. So we are not the ones. It doesn't say strengthen yourselves doesn't say that. It says being strengthened. So again, who is the implied actor? Sino. Sino an implied actor. The audience. They're not the one. So passive means the audience would be the, would be the object. Because this is being done on them. If I say, if I say competent, if I say competent, uh, uh, be strengthened with buco juice. You're not the it's one the vocal juice. Vocal juice that's doing it, Diva. So, so again, so again, here, really, this is the actor is God, the, the source, and we've already seen this. And then the Holy Spirit is the agent that does this. Okay, and, and we'll see this. So I'm not again not pulling this out of my my. my I'm not uh, the past implies someone outside of the audience, and for sure it's not Paul. It, the only other possibility is God and the Holy Spirit. And elsewhere, we see that explicitly. So I want to be very clear here. So what's being implied here is God and the Holy Spirit. Okay. The I, have, I, have, good. I have a question, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. In verse 9, sir, you mentioned uh, the word feel. The same with uh, the word uh, passive verb. Isn't it, sir? Because the word of the action in verse 9, doing the field is... is is God. Yes, yes, yes. Verse 9, the field. Yes, yes. yeah, Thomas. So, yeah. so the audience is passive also. Because, yes, Thomas. Yeah. So, but my question is here, sir, whose fault now if the, whose fault now if the Christian is not growing yeah. and is strengthened? Yeah, okay, because yeah. The source of the knowledge is God. And in verse, what verse this one? And the strengthened is the the Christian also is passive, only passive. 
Yeah. So the active verb is God. So who spoke now? The the source is God. The filling is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yes, sir. That, that does not minimize our call to action. So the source. So for the here's the same thing. Dibak. So a Christian mm. is called the source of. Now there's debate here, but the source of our faith is from. My understanding is it's from God. It's the Holy the Holy Spirit. But we are still called to exercise the faith. So I do not take credit for the faith because where I'm receiving the faith from is from God. But I have to exercise the faith. Okay. So in in the same way here, of course, the filling is is God that He's the source. But we still have to act. We 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 are given those things, but we have to act. And so this is the this would be the mystery between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. We are always responsible to act. And, and, and of course, there's the prayer that we would be filled. There is the, by, by Paul. Um, and Diba, we see this in Philippians, right? He, he, he prays for them, but then he says, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work will bring it to completion. And so there is the assurance that those who are truly being filled God will bring this to completion. That's why it always comes back to God, okay? But mm. I, I understand your question, Rodrigo. I, we don't want to minimize the act itself of, of doing, it. of, doing of, of, of bearing fruit and increasing. Mm. Of course, the source, uh, it's like being rooted. We're going to see this later, being rooted in Christ. But Christ is the root, but we still have to produce the fruit. Are you exercise like yeah. the, the one Paul mentioned it, it, it said you work out your salvation yeah. yes perfect so what's in you you work it out but you will grow more it's like work. <laughs> let's let's okay uh that is the perfect example let's go there really quick let's go there really quick I think that's the absolute perfect example of what we're looking at here so let's go to um let's go to Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 and this is in verse, I think this is the perfect example of Rodrigo so that we can see this, okay? Therefore, my beloved bro brothers, uh, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but also much more my my absence. So here we go. I don't want to mess this up here. Uh, this is a command. Work out. <laughs> this is a command. Work out your own salvation with fear and tr tr trembling. It is God who works in you. It is God who works in you. <laughs> We're good. God who works in you, both to, to will and to work his own good pleasure. So, so this is, this is, uh... Tim, we may add. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the way I understand the question of Rodrigo is that, obviously, if you are truly or genuinely converted, by God, the chances are you will not really be passive or just be waiting of anything to happen. No, in most cases, the the, the work, the spirit, rather the, the the spirit will continue to work in you, and your genuineness of your conversion and your your love towards God will always compel you to do things that will really be for your spiritual growth and that will be pleasing to God. So that's how I see it. But people who claim to know God and understand God, but without doing a thing, it's not really the real conversion that they have experienced. No, you're right. You're right. Um, that's correct. So, 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 for example, Rodrigo, someone who never is successful, they're just, it's, it's very, okay, they, they, they don't grow. They're not using knowledge. They're not living a life of good. It becomes very clear that in actuality, this has not happened to them. So that's the first thing I, I want to say, which, which is right in line with what, with, which, is what, what, with, which is what Ray is saying. The other thing I want to say is that there is two extremes, Diba. In one extreme, they say that it is all us. All the responsibility is for us. Um, it's all us, Diba. And the other extreme says it's all God. It's all God. Lahat, you know, what I want to say is that, um, we always must act. The act is us. But the power behind the act, the source behind the act is God. You see this here and you see this elsewhere in, in Paul. 
And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring a balance. Um, uh, God is the source, but we always must act. And there is that divine mystery of <laughs> how can that be? Now, some people say they figured it out, but at the end of the day, we are absolutely responsible. And, and, and at the same time, God is completely sovereign, meaning to say that he will bring us, he, all is confident that he who began a good work will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. Okay. So there's that divine mystery. Henry, go ahead. Okay. Can we go back to verse nine? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. There are three, there are three actors here. Okay. The one who prays, we have not ceased to pray for you. We. So this is from outside. Here it is Apostle Paul. That is we. Then he prayed for the Colossians. Yes. And God acts. Yeah. Okay. The action of God is feeling to be filled with the whole, the feeling. Yeah. Feeling with the knowledge of His will, with all spiritual wisdom. It's the work of God, but somebody has to pray for the maturity of them. No, and then, no, yes, yes, no, no, and, and then, and then, and then, just to finish here, the, the, the walking here, the walking here is uh, the actor here is the is the brothers, Diba. Right? So that's where you're saying there's the three different actors. There's Paul praying, there's God doing, and there's God filling, and then there's us who's doing. Okay? All right? So again, the, the bearing fruit and the increasing, this, this, is, this is the work of, of the brother. Okay? So we're supposed to be increasing in knowledge of God. We're supposed to be bearing fruit. We're the ones walking. Okay? But at the same time, in the context, the, 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 the curtain is being peeled back and we're seeing what's going on behind the scenes. Really, us walking and doing and increasing is the work of the gospel. It is the work of, the whole, of, of God. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. We, yeah. We, want, we want to, we, it's all three. <laughs> so, we are, it's like saying we are the hands and feet and eyes of the Lord. So it's speaking through us in, in that manner, but while we do while we do the the act itself, but any it, the thing that we are just the vessel or the instrument for which God uh, makes His action uh, known to other people. Rodrigo, thank you for that question. Excellent that question. question. Excellent question. That's what that that has brought clarity, and I really appreciate the question. And that's something we all wrestle with. I wrestle with that so much. Sometimes I was always on this side. Sometimes I was on that yeah. side. We're, we're trying to be in the middle. We're trying to be in the middle. Um, so great question. Really appreciate that. Those are the type of questions we want to be asking. Okay, let's, it is getting late. Let's, let's finish this. I'm just going to finish in verse, let's finish in verse 11. And then we'll continue. We'll just complete this and, and continue on in, for, for next week. Um, and then this purpose here, we have this, this, this purpose. Mm. We, have a, we have a last, a final purpose here. The, the strengthening is for what? Is for, it, it, this comes back. The strengthening is God, but the purpose is what? Is for their, is for their endurance and patience. <laughs> the audience. So this is their work. Patience is a work. Let's just be clear. Stopping yourself from doing something is a work. That takes incredible focus. That takes incredible self-control. So anyone who, I actually think one of the biggest signs of self-control is someone, if they can have patience or not. I, I, I really come to see that. Patience is an incredible, an incredible gift to have and it's only by the strengthening of god the holy spirit and then of course the manner the manner is with joy 
So we cannot do this grumbling or complaining. We cannot do this grumbling or complaining. So uh, just for compliance team. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. So what I want us to say here, I, I want us to and, and it's already it's late. I want us to conclude now. Let's go back to our our PowerPoint um in conclusion. So what is the God? Okay, so then what is the content of good works? Okay, so we did not actually answer the content of the good works. We will get that next week. Okay, we will get the content of the good works next week just by way of conclusion. Okay, just by way of conclusion. What is the gospel accomplishing? What is the gospel bearing fruit and increasing, both in conversion and in sanctification? Okay, so the gospel is both producing fruit and growing, both in bringing people in. To, to, to the faith, and it's also producing fruit and growing in us, okay? The content of the prayer is to, is to be filled with knowledge in all spiritual wisdom and insight or all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we walk worthy in a manner of our Lord and that we're mm. increasing in the knowledge of God and that we're also bearing fruit in good works, okay? That's the content and then, we're, and then the last part is being strengthened by his glorious might so that we have endurance and patience. So that is the yeah. content of the prayer. That is the prayer for Paul for the rest of this epistle. That is the main point he's trying to do. And then the relationship between uh, knowledge and good works is knowledge is more fundamental, but both are very important, okay? Yeah. And then the content of good works, we will deal with that next week. Um, and just by way of, uh, I have a picture for us to think about. These are mm. fruit. So when, so when Paul was talking about bearing fruit, this mm -hmm. is these are the two favorite fruit fruits in Colossae. Grapes, we love grapes. Grape, grape juice, grapes are just amazing fruit. And then figs. The figs actually kind of looks almost like a pomelo. Pomelo. Pomelo, pomelo yeah. Uh, yeah, Pomelo. So it almost, but they love, they love the fig. But what I'm trying to emphasize is that what I want us to do and what I want us to be, so, so if I was preaching or teaching this and we were in the class or I'm in my church, perhaps you could bring some fruit as an ex exhibit and have them taste. It doesn't have to be expensive, but that could be, that could be something, especially for children. If you're, if we're teaching on this, this is the primary il illustration of the gospel, what we're supposed to be doing bring in the fruit and talk to them about how it's so tasty, how it's so nice. And then use that as a, as a spiritual springboard to say, this is how we should be. This is how the gospel tasty. tastes. <laughs> um, and you can even talk about sour fruit. We want to be ripe fruit that's tasty. Yeah. Like the yellow yeah. mango, Cebu mango. Okay, so that's just a way that if I was teaching this with children or teens, I would do that. If I was preaching and there was an opportunity, it wasn't a big church and there was a possible, or have everyone bring a kind of fruit. And then at the end, have everyone bring it together. And just oftentimes the word of God uses physical images to teach spiritual truths. And Jesus does the same thing. And the more that we bring in those, those physical images, whenever, you're, whenever your uh, students or whenever your members walk down to the market, Tell them, think about what kind of fruit are you? How good is your fruit? I'm not durian. Fruit. I'm a durian fruit. It smells bad, but tastes good. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but no. Um, no it, it, I mean, the, the, the thing with durian, you, know, you, you probably speak, not just analogy. You speak the word of God, word of God may be hurting. Or that's a <laughs> there you go. That it smell good, but... No. but you know, that's you contextualizing, brother. That's good. That's contextualizing. So okay, that's contextualizing. Okay. That's, that, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a great, this is a great way, especially for the children. When you go and have that sweet mango, I want you to be thinking about what is your fruit? What is your fruit like? And, and, and the, the, your your members will never forget that. They will go down to the market and they will they will be thinking as they're buying the fruit. They will be thinking about their own their own good works, which is good. And the gospel. They'll be thinking about the gospel. Maybe it'll be a, a segue, you, you know, going like, you know, the, the fruit talks about the gospel. Like you can use that as a springboard to share the gospel. Maybe you can be handing it out 
<laughs> Can we talk to you about the gospel? Let's do a survey, something like that. I don't know. But but these are yeah. innovative ways. These are innovative ways for us to to interact that are different. That just I mean, there's just so much there's so much we can do here. Um just in by way of a conclusion now, um your assignment for next week. <laughs> is uh, Colossians 13 to, uh, 1, 13 to 23. I would like five questions, if you can do five questions and five observations. So you were making some awesome observations and questions today. You had great observations and questions. Let's try to, to, to prepare for next week with five observations and five questions. And I will repost what a good observation is, what a good question is. Okay, I'll repost that. And um, I also need to post the, uh, the video on... Um, on um, the apostle thing so um let's close in prayer and uh dear heavenly father god we pray for each one here we pray for each church that is represented here father i ask that they would be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual insight and, and wisdom so that each one of us and they and their members would walk in a manner worthy of the lord fully pleasing to him full of, of good fruit, of good works, and always increasing in the knowledge of your Son. And Father God, we ask that you would be strengthening them with your glorious might, might that we don't have, and that they would have endurance and patience during this difficult time in joy. Father God, we pray this prayer for each one here. And we ask that you would give us the strength to be people that are committed to growing in knowledge and also in good works. We love you so much, Heavenly Father. We don't deserve the position you put us in. Give us the strength to do your will. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.